morning on behalf of everybody at NCAR. It's a joy and an honor to welcome you to IPF, uh, to the 20th edition of IPF, and also to our first IPF at our fancy new campus and building. Um, you know, Dumbledore tells Harry Potter in Chamber of Secrets, it is our choices more than our abilities that reveal what we really are. And when the board was crafting a 10-year strategy for NCAR, we debated a major hardware investment, right? Because we're obviously mindful of the criticism that you shouldn't confuse think tank buildings with building think tanks. But we also felt it was time to recognize that five-star facilities don't always signal waste. You know, sometimes they just signal excellence and globally benchmarked ambitions. But now we've really moved into the software phase of NCAR, you know, resident team, which is headed by Poonam with Sonal, Sanjeev, Banali, and Poonam, have ambitious talent and growth plans. Obviously, visiting faculty like Arvind, Panagarya, Bari, Ratna, Ajay Mahal, Barbara, and Praveen are you know, wonderful contributors and really helping us with strategy, capabilities, and goals. I think we're producing innovative research and unique databases. We are also becoming an interesting convening platform and really influencing and informing policy directly. Obviously, in my mind, the IPF comes at a very unique time for India and economics. You know, when I landed in the US in August 94 for my MBA, there was a front page article on the Wall Street Journal which said that India is more interesting than important. I hope that journalist is eating the newspaper on which he wrote that, right? Because obviously what's happening in India isn't once in a millennium or once in a decade, it's once in a lifetime of a country. But you know, 50% of our foreign direct investment since 1947 has come in the last five years. In 2021, India exported more software than Saudi Arabia did oil. So it's obviously above my pay grade to talk about economics, but in the last few decades, I do worry about the excessive expectations and promises from fiscal and monetary policy to help prosperity at least. You know, if fiscal deficits could make countries rich, then no country would be poor. And I haven't made up my mind whether monetary policy is a placebo, a painkiller, or a steroid. But it's definitely not a medicine for our challenges of productivity in states, in cities, in firms, and in people. You know, Jonas Sachs, the, the inventor of the polio vaccine, wrote in his biography, the only question to ask yourself is, are you being a good ancestor? And I recently met the chief minister of a state who's planning to reintroduce index-linked defined benefit pensions for civil servants about A, how he was going to pay for it, and B, how is it fair that 58% of the state budget will now go to 5% of the state's population? You know, without mis missing a beat, he said, I don't have to pay these pensions. The chief minister 25 years later has to pay these pensions. You know, growing up in Kashmir, they made an interesting distinction between Amanat and Jagir. You know, Jagir is yours, it belongs to you, right? The king of Kuch Bihar used to spend 50% of the state treasury on Rolls Royce and Cartier. It was his Jagir, right? But Amanat means you're supposed to hand it over in better condition than you got it. And in my mind, at least, I'm delighted that this year's IPF agenda really focuses on being a good ancestor. Obviously, I'm biased, but I really love the debt paper by Barry, Poonam, and Aisha, but obviously the other stuff on fiscal sustainability, productivity, gender, is really stuff in my mind that, that makes us more productive as a country. And, but being a good ancestor really requires strength. You know, my favorite Hindi poet is Ramdhari Singh Dinkar. He says, Shama shobitiyus bujang ko jiske paas garal ho. You know, only snakes with venom can be kind, benevolent, and generous. You know, toothless, venomless snakes can't do anything. Obviously, being strong means more aircraft squadrons, more um, mountain brigades. But I think it really means globally competitive universities, think tanks, journals, and government schools. You know, being a think tank in India feels sometimes harder than being a think tank in other countries for various reasons, you know, funding sources, you know, small lateral entry into government, and obviously sometimes domestic talent preferences for universities. But I think NCR is changing and hopes to change that game. You know, we're, we're an important bridge between theory and practice. We advocate sort of m not more cooks in the kitchen, but a different recipe economically. And I think that's really what the idea behind the renovation, both hardware and software of NCR is. So please treat NCR as your base, as your home, as your partner in India and in Delhi. Uh, we welcome broader engagement. We're still figuring out um, how think tanks can be better bridges. We hope you will spend time here 
part of your sabbatical, part of your time, full time visiting. We've got multiple sort of ways to work together. We recognize that think tanks are different from universities. And we have to really um, you know, make ourselves relevant in ways that we don't really know yet. And we hope we're counting on all of you, we're counting on IPF, we're counting on the other stuff we do to really help us figure out the role of a think tank, um, a domestic think tank, um, uh, in, in the next sort of decade. So on behalf of everybody at NCR, you know, vanakam, khushamdeed, and swagatam to IPF. Have a great two days. <laughs> now, I'm going to hand over to um, Poonam. Oh. Yes, um, Mr. Singh is on his way. He'll be there in about three minutes. Um, but given that it's the first session and it, we don't want to overrun too much, perhaps um, introductions he will do. But perhaps I can start with the presentation. The first paper, as you know, is on India's debt dilemma, uh, co-authored by uh, Professor Barry Eigen Green and myself. And then we have two esteemed uh, discussions. Um, I was going to go first. So if it's OK, I'll still make the presentation. Thank you. So the speech that you just heard from Manish, I know it word by word because I've heard it many times. And this is how we are trying to do things at NCR. Um, Amanat not Zagir. So it is to be passed on to the next generations and not to be treated as a personal fiefdom. So here we are. Um, India's debt dilemma. Um, what is the issue and why are we interested in this issue? Uh, the context is, as many of you uh, who are either a macroeconomist or have a general interest in the Indian economy or have tracked uh, the Indian econ economy over the past few years, know that India's public debt is considered to be high. It is not just high, it has increased over a 40-year period. So, um, you know, I started working on India uh, at the IMF. I joined the IMF in 1998. And whichever team would work on India will look at the level of public debt and will exclaim that this debt is not sustainable, that there will be a crisis sooner or later, and something needs to be done about it. Interestingly, there have not been any crisis since 1991. Um, there has not been a run on debt, and the debt distress of any kind is not apparent. And when you have a situation like this, it's very difficult to convince the policymakers that it's an issue that matters, and therefore you should look at it, and you should consider it seriously. Politicians in India get very concerned about inflation, because those have direct electoral outcomes. They obviously get concerned about growth, but more than growth, they get concerned about employment. But they don't talk about public debt and deficits, and the fact that they can have some adverse implications for the economy. Um, and, and this is the role that we independent researchers at an independent think tanks are trying to do. So India's debt has been high in a cross-country context. It has increased over the years. There are short periods when debt did decline, but those declines did not, um, uh, were not durable, and debt reversed again. The largest increase in debt in recent history was during COVID. Once you increase your public debt, it's very hard to bring it down. When you start spending more on specific issues, on specific constituencies, it's very hard to bring down those expenditure levels. So even though the debt has declined from the pandemic highs, the decline is gentle and is unlikely to come down to the pre-COVID levels anytime soon. Welcome, Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh, it's just the first slide of the presentation in which I'm just showing the level of public debt in India and how it has increased over a four-year decade. There have been periods of decline, but those declines have not sustained. And the levels of de uh, debts have reverted back to uh, an increasing trajectory. 
So the issues really here are fourfold. Is India's public debt sustainable and how do we define sustainability? Is the projected debt going to explode? Is it going to increase very rapidly? Country has certainly lived with a debt level of um, 80, 85, but is it going to go any worse from here? And if so, will there be any implications of that? Another risk which one sees in other countries, especially in countries in Latin America, is a rollover risk. That the market starts showing risk uh, distress in, in the debt market. We don't see that in India, but we try to understand, do we actually have a risk of rollover, and if not, why? We have also done some very simple linear projections on debt of the general government, but also separately for the center and the states. And we ask, what would these debt trajectories look like under some simplifying assumptions? And then the real meat of this work, what are the costs and risks associated, both with the current as well as the projected levels of debt? And what are the implications and policy suggestions? And Professor Eigen Green is, um, is better versed with these, given his deep international experiences. And he will enlighten us on the last bullet points. So one cost of this very high level of public debt is that interest payments as percentage of GDP has been close to 5%. Interest payments use up a quarter of all revenues. Interest payments have exceeded the combined ex uh, expenditure on education and health. It's more than the entire capital expenditure of the government. So it's certainly one cost that the government pays. Again, does not result in any rollover risk or any stress in the debt market. When we look at different parts of India's fiscal outcomes, we see a huge amount of stickiness in them. Uh, so no matter which component of India's public accounts we look at, whether it's revenue, whether it's expenditure, whether it's different parts of revenue and expenditure, or the combination of all, all of them, which is fiscal deficit, uh, fiscal deficit and all other components have been broadly steady over a 40-year period. So here we have the data for general government. Fiscal deficit has not just been high at 7% or above. It has more or less remained at that level. So those dashed lines are decadal averages. It increased to unprecedented levels during COVID, and it's slow to return to the pre-COVID levels. This stickiness is also seen in other components, as I mentioned. Total revenue to GDP ratio has increased only by a cumulative 1.5 percentage point of GDP in the last four decades, which means that the tax buoyancy is 1%. Percentage increase in, in, uh, in tax is about the same as percentage increase in nominal GDP. We do hear a lot about GST being a promise, etc. But the thing is that the nominal GDP has been growing at about 12%. And your tax revenue is growing at a very impressive rate of 12%, which means the tax to GDP ratio is not changing. Um, so this is separately for both non-tax and no, uh, tax and non-tax revenues, um, again, fairly steady. But let's look at the total expenditure. Again, about 25, 26, 27% of GDP. It's not that India spends a whole lot. So when you hear about fiscal deficit being high, it's not that, the in, that India has a very large government and it's spending too much, at least in an aggregate sense. Again, it has stayed stable at these levels. When we look at revenue expenditure and capital expenditure, and this is where um, you know, interesting details start coming about the quality of public finances in India. Revenue deficit has been about 22 to 23% of GDP. A steady 85% of the total expenditure is on recurrent non-discretionary expenditures, which includes things such as wages and pensions and so on. Capital expenditure, though has increased in the last two years, is very, very small. When we compare India's fiscal indicators with other country averages, and we have done it in two ways, we compare India's um, fiscal outcomes with the global averages, which is the case here. The solid black line is the median of all countries uh, for which the IMF tracks the data, uh, 180 plus countries, and we have the interquartile range. 
So, India's public debt, fiscal deficit and interest payments, all as percentage of its GDP, have been much above the top 25 percent. So, India has been an outlier. And here we are comparing actually India's revenue and expenditure only with the sample of other emerging markets, 50 some countries. And here what we see is that its expenditure is about the same level as the median of other countries. It's the revenue which is below the, the bottom quartile. And Dr. Rao has written extensively on it. Uh, we have cited some of his work and we will be citing more of his work in our revised version of the paper. So all we have talked about so far very quickly is that India's debt and deficits have been high. They have remained high. Sticky fiscal outcomes imply that outcomes are not going to evolve very differently in coming years. Similar levels of debt have resulted in debt distress in other countries, which means that then such distress become a becomes a pressure on policymakers to act, but there has not been debt distress in India. And that is what we look at now. Why is that the case? And for that, we look at the composition of debt. So India's debt is managed both for the center and the states. It's managed by the Reserve Bank of India, its central bank. And it has done a rather good job as, as, as the debt manager. So 90% of India's debt is long term. If anything, the average maturity of debt is increasing. The central government is able to raise longer term debt and that debt maturity has increased. States borrow shorter term, but even they are able to now raise longer term debt. Some states are raising debt for as long as 20 years and above. Almost all of this debt is raised at fixed rates, which means that it's insulated from short run interest rate volatility. The kind of volatility we see in more advanced countries and markets such as the US, you know, interest rates go up and down, um, but there is very little fallout of that on, on the interest rate that is paid on public debt. Most of this debt is raised domestically, and that is the lesson that was learned from the 1991 crisis. 96% of the de debt is raised domestically, only 4% is externally ra raised, and that is also from multilateral institutions, such as the World Bank, and Junaid is responsible for some of that borrowing that India did. But it's in foreign currency, so there is a currency risk, but it's, it's quite small. And multilaterals, they do not stage a run on your debt. So even if there is a currency risk, it's, it's well managed. Debt is in, held institutionally. All of this is by design, right, to make India's debt um, rather safe. Uh, there were uh, times until the early two mid-2000s, when banks were holding a very large share of public debt, public sector banks in particular were holding a much larger share of public de debt than their counterparts in private sector. Since then, two things have happened. The statutory liquidity ratio under which the banks are mandated to hold their assets in public securities has declined. So a decline in financial repression in a way that ratio has declined from 38% to 18%. In addition, public sector banks who were either willingly or were being asked or coaxed to hold more public debt than even mandated have declined their ratios as well. Their decline share has been taken up by in, um, investment companies and provident funds. More than 50% of those segments are still owned by the government. So, I do not fully understand the implications of the fact that public debt is still held primarily by government-owned institutions. So it's some kind of a joint family phenomenon, which certainly makes it a safer bet, right? But there has been diversification. The share of banks has declined, which means that the risk on banks from high public debt has declined, and others have stepped in. Yields have declined as well. Two things about the yields. Uh, one is that the premium between the center and the states is a steady 50 basis points. Again, something that the RBI does. Another interesting thing that Barry will talk about is there's very small dispersion in yields across the states. 
So the most indebted states and the least indebted states pay about the same. They are able to raise their debt at about the same rate. When I'm talking on most indebted and least indebted, most indebted currently is Punjab, which runs a public debt to its state GDP ratio of about 45%. The least indebted is Gujarat, among the last states, runs a public debt to state GDP ratio of about 18%, but they both raise their debt at 7%, which is very interesting. Some form of either debt management or repression, I don't have the exact name for it. So composition of debt is safe, long-term, rupee-denominated, domestic. It has improved. Rollover risk is low as, as well. And I'll just take a minute, minute and a half, to talk about the projections for debt before I hand it over to Professor Eigen Green. So we are doing a debt sustainability analysis under very simple assumptions. We have to have a baseline. Debt sustainability analysis depends on uh, projections of three variables or assumptions on three variables. Real growth, primary deficit as percentage of GDP, and interest rates at which the debt can be raised. A baseline is that these three variables in the next five years will evolve at the same rate at which they have, uh, uh, the rate at which they have grown in the last 10 years. So our baseline is past 10 year averages of growth, primary deficit, and interest rates. And we do change things here and there around this baseline, but not much is different when we do that. Our scenarios are growth can be higher by one standard deviation, primary deficit can be lower, and or contingent liabilities are absorbed at a certain rate every year. So the red line here is the baseline scenario, which means that debt will increase gently, but it's not runaway debt. It's not an explosion of debt. This is for the general government. If we have a more benign scenario where growth increases and primary deficit declines, then debt can be lower. But just keep in mind that stickiness in fiscal out outcomes that we saw. Very hard to raise more revenue or, or, or reduce your expenditures. So, pr for, but, so for primary deficit to decline below the last 10 year averages is unlikely to happen anytime soon. Um, and if contingent liabilities are absorbed at a certain rate, then debt can increase to above 90% level. More interesting things, uh, so this is on contingent liabilities, which is a big issue as we are discovering at the state level. Just one line here, for those who do not necessarily dabble into uh, public finance, you know, this famous paper by Blanchard, that if your real growth is more than your real interest rate, you're good. You're not good if you're an Indian economy or many other emerging markets. The two things that differ high primary deficit and contingent liabilities. So very quickly, all of the last 40 years, India's real growth has been higher than its real interest rate, but debt has increased, right? Because contingent liabilities get absorbed over time, and India is running high primary deficit, and contingent liabilities, at least at the state levels, remain a concern. So debt evolution for the central government, same assumptions that it will grow, run primary deficit, and phase interest rates that it has faced in the last 10 years means that debt to GDP ratio in the baseline will stabilize. Center runs uh, lesser amount of contingent liabilities, so that risk is also somewhat milder. And if, of course, it manages to do a few things well, then its debt to GDP ratio can decline. For the state governments, on the other hand, given that it has larger contingent liabilities, um, it faces slightly higher interest rates. Um, it's even in its baseline scenario, debt to GDP ratio is going to increase. And if it absorbs contingent liabilities at the pace that it has done in the last few years, then its debt to GDP ratio will increase even further. One of the last slides, and this is actually work in progress. Both Barry and I are quite excited to take this work uh, in much more depth to state finances, an issue that is very, very important, uh, especially that the, uh, especially because the next finance commission would be set up uh, this year, this calendar year. So what we are doing is we have taken 18 of the larger states. We have divided them into two groups, states which have accumulated debt to GDP ratio more than the median, and states which have accumulated debt to GDP ratio at a below median level. And what is so different about these two states? 
So, there are a couple of things which stand out because the coefficients are significant. States which are running more than, uh, which have incurred more than the median increase in debt have twice as high the primary deficit as the control group more than twice as large the contingent liabilities as the control group. But two things to notice here, they have practically the same nominal interest rate, column three, right? No, no, no difference. And at the state level, inflation rates also do not differ much. Um, last two slides, Gujarat is on a virtuous path. Uh, low debt to GDP ratio is projected to decline further, practically zero contingent liabilities. Punjab is on a vicious path, high debt to GDP ratio is projected to increase further. If it, if it absorbs its contingent liabilities the way it has in the past, it can increase to 60% in the next five years. And how is that sustainable at the state level is, is an interesting question. Barry, over to you, sorry if I overran. So Poonam has done a very good job at um, summarizing not only the first half of the paper, but the entire paper. So I will highlight a few of the points uh, that you have, have um, already heard. As I think about the paper, there is a positive question and a normative question. The positive question is how is uh, public debt likely to evolve in India in the, in, in the future? And the uh, answer to that question uh, in, in, in the paper derived from some mechanical simulations and from some political economy analysis. Both is that India will continue hap, uh, to, to live with uh, elevated levels uh, uh, of public debt that it currently um, uh, faces and that there are few if any plausible scenarios for economic growth and, and uh, uh, revenue growth and so forth that will put that debt on a downward path. The normative question in the paper is, should we worry about that fact? And my answer to that normative question would be yes and no. Um, and, and you heard the yes and no part as well, that the structure of India's debt, not, not only the level of debt is an outlier from a, uh, the standpoint of emerging markets or a broader class of countries, but the structure of the debt is an outlier as well which affects uh, the extent to which uh, uh, that we should worry and the nature of those worries. Um, so what are the costs and risks, uh, if any, associated with this uh, high level of public debt? You heard and saw that uh, interest payments are high by international standards, that they exceed 25% of general government, some of state and central government, revenues, which is roughly double the emerging market and developing country average. At 5% of GDP, they absorb again about twice the emerging market average. The government spends more on interest than it does on education and health combined. The government spends more on interest than it does on capital formation. Second and relatedly, uh, the public sector is going to face new challenges in India is elsewhere going forward. Uh, the available fiscal resources leave little room for meeting uh, emerging priorities like climate change abatement and adaptation and the green uh, transition. If you look at studies of, uh, uh, of this problem, India will have to spend half again as much as a share of GDP as uh, other countries uh, between now and 2050 on decarbonization and low carbon growth because of the nature and size of its urban population, its um, uh, climate geography, and so forth. Not all of that investment will have to come from uh, the public sector. Com some can come in the form of public-private partnerships, but there are risks that the private sector is unlikely to bear and finance all, all on its own. Uh, regulatory risk, planning risk, extreme weather risks, so there will be a substantial public finance contribution to uh, the climate, the green transition, uh, unavoidably, and having to devote a substantial share of the available tax revenues to interest payments makes this more difficult. 
third, uh, debt dynamics leave little room for responding to shocks, be they macroeconomic shocks, be they declining rates of domestic economic growth and or global growth. So India did a substantial fiscal stimulus, uh, fiscal program in response to COVID-19, uh, about four or five percent of GDP above the line and another four or five percent of GDP below the line. So again, the fact that uh, uh, government was able to respond with a fiscal program of 9% of GDP is a reminder that there was and is no immediate crisis of debt sustainability. But sooner or later, responding to shocks in this way will begin to show up in, in interest rates. So the co-authors have been struggling with the absence of an interest rate response to date, but we are um, conventional economists, so we strongly believe that at some point markets and interest rates will begin to respond to debt levels and the government will be constrained in its ability to respond uh, to similar shocks in, in, in the future. Alternatively, if it's committed to maintaining debt sustain sustainability, it will be countercyclically constrained and that will have uh, adverse implications for cyclical stability. Fourth and finally, there may not be immediate financial stability risks, but the possibility of financial stability risks in the future cannot be ruled out. So Poonam described how the banks are required by regulation to hold government uh, securities to satisfy their statutory liquidity ratios, but those requirements have been cut by more than half over time. The banks are also mandated to hold other highly liquid assets, which has insulated them from uh, portfolio repricing risks, Silicon Valley Bank style balance sheet risk, although uh, not eliminated, eliminating it entirely. And uh, in, in insurance companies and provident funds uh, uh, hold government securities by choice, but they also hold government securities by, um, by regulation in substantial amounts. So we've seen in the reduction of statutory liquidity ratios and we can well imagine over time with uh, uh, the uh, further progress of financial development, development and financial liberalization, uh, these captive sources of demand for government securities will become relatively less important and the government will have to rely on domestic retail investors, or if domestic savings are not sufficient, international investors as uh, a, a source of demand for that public debt. One reason that the public debt landscape has been as stable as it has in India, as we heard, is that reliance on international markets has been minimal. And again, one can imagine uh, that India will have to turn to those international markets to a greater extent in, in, in the future, and we know from the experience of many other countries how capital flows, capital can uh, flow in in large amounts and reverse direction unpredictably with destabilizing consequences for the market. So uh, uh, again, this is not a prediction of, of what will happen next year, but a plausible scenario we would argue for the medium term. Uh, so, um, as you heard, um, our analysis suggests that contrary to analyses for other countries, the work that Alberto Alessina and others did for the advanced economies, the problem in India is not that spending is too high, but that revenues are too low, uh, that the task going forward in order to keep public debt on a stable trajectory is to raise additional revenue through uh, higher uh, tax receipts, non-tax receipts, notably um, privatization receipts to continue to improve tax administration, uh, continue to digitize um, tax ad, uh, ad, ad administration along the line of lines of recent tax reforms that have uh, modestly uh, boosted uh, the growth of revenues modestly increased the elasticity of um, tax revenues with respect to GDP to slightly above 
unity and it's important to limit the contingent liabilities um, that Poonam referred to before. I think the next paper on the program is about the public power sector, uh, the power sector, which is a, 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 a prime case in point where uh, states have uh, assumed significant um, contingent liabilities. Uh, the other way I would summarize the paper is that the principal threat to the sustainability of the public debt over time uh, derives not from the balance sheet of, uh, of the central government, but rather from the balance sheets uh, uh, of the states. So what you see here is our baseline projection for uh, gross state government debt to GDP, which is trending upward if you extrapolate mechanically from the last 10 years and could plausibly trend uh, upward even more dramatically if economic growth uh, slows a bit and other variables evolve in an unfavorable way. And this average for state governments is driven by a subset of problem children, if you will, which are more extreme uh, cases uh, of high, le high levels uh, of, of state, high and in increasing levels of state debt. So why, w what are the sources of this state debt problem? There's a lot of international evidence from other federal states that where there are large vertical fiscal imbalances, where the central government raises the revenue and the states do the spending, and they rely on transfers from the center, that creates a moral hazard or a deficit bias where state level politicians, decision makers get the credit from the spending programs. They are, they are biased in favor of larger spending programs. They turn to the center for the necessary finance and they get it only in part. So the, we, I, I, I think we will hear more from our chairman and from others about the operation uh, uh, of the Finance Commission, which meets every, every five years, which basically decides the rules for those vertical fiscal transfers. Um, and fiscal commissions are uh, in instructed to allocate more resources to states with larger budget deficits, which creates an obvious uh, deficit bias or um, moral hazard. Uh, the most recent finance commission included tax effort as one of the criteria governing uh, the magnitude of those transfers. But if I understand correctly, it's really only a subsidiary <laughs> criterion. It governs only a, a small portion of the overall transfer. So um, keying a portion of that vertical transfer to tax effort doesn't accomplish very much. It doesn't solve the problem on the expenditure side. Moreover, finance commissions are dissolved immediately after they report to the president. There is no permanent institution or body to monitor states' finances and assess whether they've departed from the course projected by the finance commission. So one proposal would be to establish a permanent fiscal council or expenditure council to monitor state finances, assess the quality and, 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 and data of state government forecasts, inform the public of the state's fiscal stance, and more generally in, in, in inform debate about the sustainability of the debts of different states. Um, the, the big mystery in, 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 in the paper, and the two co-authors ha have discussed a little bit uh, how much emphasis to put on this is, is why in, uh, uh, interest rates faced by different state governments don't vary. So um, people, there's no audience better place than this one to correct me if there does in fact exist a literature and substantial research on this question. We were not, not able to find it. So we, we talked to some practitioners. Every practitioner I talked to suggested a different reason for why there's no variation across states in borrowing costs. Number one, the bonds of different states are all el eligible for the Reserve Bank's repo facility subject to the same haircut. So for people who hold those bonds and, and, and might need the liquidity, they're indifferent between the bonds of different states. Banks, number two, banks are allowed to mark to market different states' bonds identically. 
Number three, all state bonds held by banks carry zero risk weights, which I would observe uh, in, in, in passing is, very, is a big departure from international practice. It's not the case in most other countries. The Reserve Bank provides states with short-term loans up to a, a specified percentage of their borrowing costs, in effect subsidizing their debts and deficits. And at the end of the day, uh, some practitioners suggested to me that state government bonds are implicitly covered by a broader central bank and government guarantee. So ag uh, again, investors are, are indifferent between those of um, Gujarat and, 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 and Punjab. So I think looking further into these uh, hypotheses ought to be an uh, Im Im important topic for future research. Ha having, having said that, that's a story about why the, uh, the, the, the debts of different states are all the same and are, are effectively subsidized. That doesn't tell us much about the political economy and when you look at different states you see very different political choices and public debt outcomes. So that too I think is an important topic for future research. So the conclusion of the paper is that India faces no immediate crisis of, of debt sustainability. That statement is not the same as saying that the country's rel relatively high public debt is without costs. Um, uh, that servicing that high public debt leaves fewer resources for other priorities. At some point it will leave less room for responding to shocks. Even if volatility and risks are limited now, that could change in the future with financial liberalization and deregulation, all of which means there is no room for missteps. And another conclusion would be that uh, there seems to be relatively little uh, public debate about whether, whether uh, government debt is a problem in India or not, and relatively little research on that question compared to uh, uh, other issues that preoccupy the, the research community in, in India. There should be more public discussion and there should be more research. Thank you, uh, thank you Barry. I think that, uh, may I request now Govind Rao to make uh, his intervention. Govind, you are at a slight disadvantage because uh, for some reason, uh, I think that both of us have been connected with finance commissions uh, mm -hmm. in one form or the other. So, Govind, uh, there are some suggestions implicit in what Poonam and Barry has said, and you maybe should respond to that. How much time should I take? Uh, About 15 minutes. 15. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me at the outset uh, express, express my gratitude uh, to Poonam um, and uh, in generally to the India Policy Forum because I've been one of those persons who has been associated with the Indian Policy for Forum almost from the beginning. So it has been a 20 years long journey and uh, I don't know how long I'll do this but then you know it's continued to be a, 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 an interesting journey. Um, and success you, Director General of NCAR has have uh, spent considerable time, and uh, Arvind was the the foundation force, uh, if I may say, in this uh, long uh, period. Um, so my gratitude to all the NCAR and uh, the Director success you, Director General, and and Poonam in particular. Um, this is uh, an interesting paper and in fact I'd like to welcome Poonam to a small group of people who, you know, in fact at some point of time um, I was branded as a fiscal fundamentalist. <laughs> so Poonam, welcome to this fiscal fundamentalist group. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so in fact, when I was told that you are a fiscal fundamentalist, 
in one of those meetings, um, I said, uh, I take it as a compliment. So I do consider this as a compliment because I think fiscal conservatism always pays. Um, this is an excellent paper. India's uh, deficits and debt are among the highest among the, in the developing world. This is let, to briefly summarize as I understand the paper. This was so even before the pandemic, pandemic pushed the envelope further. The good news is that the debt is expected to remain broadly stable under the reasonable assumptions. The authors make projections based on baseline scenario, lower interest rates and lower primary deficit. The bad news is that unlike, this is unlikely to significantly decline in the absence of a politically difficult reform. I am quoting that. Uh, due to high spending requirements for social services, infrastructure, and green transition, which uh, Barry mentioned a little while ago in detail, and difficulty in raising the revenue GDP ratio in the medium term. Furthermore, the acceleration in growth and reduction in the interest rates are unlikely to work out favorable debt dynamics. The elevated debt levels pose several problems with the adverse effects on economic growth. These include high interest payments, limiting the ability to release resources for emerging social and economic services, inability to meet the requirements of emerging priorities, inability to calibrate countercyclical policy, uh, policies and uh, uh, respond uh, to shocks, enhanced fiscal stability risks due to the banks holding large volume of government securities, um, they call it a diabolic loop. Uh, finally, the, with further financial liberalization, increased pressure to market the debt to foreign investors and less to the domestic captive market. Though the rollover risk is not uh, seen, this is a factor to be considered. As I mentioned, I briefly, I mean, this is a brief summary of what I understand from the paper. It's an excellent paper. It's very timely and it's extremely important. Now, my comments will be basically on some of the details and a bit on the, on the projections that they make. Tax increase by, nine, you know, from 1981 to 22 is only by 3.3 3 uh, percentage points, as they say. This does not reveal some interesting trends in between. Between 81 and 92, actually tax ratio declined. And tax ratio declined by two percentage points. And one percentage point because of the, the, the reforms, you know, bringing in the, the, the customs duty is lower. One percentage point increase in income tax because they started doing the reform. Of course, much more reform was done in 1996, 97. Uh, Mr. N. K. Singh is responsible for that. Um, you know, I, I will not go into that. But there was a near one percentage point increase in income tax, but a two percentage point deduction, reduction in union excise duties. They called it a more that, which in fact, uh, without doing the proper this thing, the 1976. Uh, report of the JA committee was implemented in 1986-87 and without reducing the number of rates with several rates happen in this thing they had something like a deemed credit and all sorts of uh, confusions that was created and as a result the union excise duty declined by two percentage points so center's decline was from 10.2% to 8.2% during this period. And similarly, from 2004 to 2007, there was a sharp increase in income tax and uh, service tax. That's because they brought in a very major reform called tax information uh, network. Um, you know, there was a report by the Control and Auditor General, which said that those employers and other contractors who are supposed to detect the tax source and file the return, never file the return. 
never they kept the detected the taxes stores uh, taxes stores didn't give the money to the government and income tax department had no clue and it is in that context that tax information network was instituted uh, dr kilker uh, was responsible for that particular thing and income tax revenue increased on year on year basis by it's about 32% and in the meantime there was an expansion in service tax base and obviously service tax increased by about over 50% during that peri particular period so so there are some interesting things that in between then one has to see and similarly on the expenditure side um, the paper attributes uh, the sharp increase in expenditure in 2008-9 to the global financial crisis global global financial crisis had nothing to do with this it was 19 2008-9 it's a electoral budget cycle there were three decisions taken in that particular budget farm loan over loan waiver pay commission application of fame pay commission recommendation and expansion of rural employment guarantee from 200 to check to the whole country and uh, in fact the budget had projected 2.5% fiscal deficit but actually and the oil prices increased by uh, you know sort of to $165 a barrel sometimes in the june of 2008 and june july of 19, 2008 and obviously that year the center's fiscal deficit ended up at 7.5% gdp and there afterwards we have never been able to really match you know sort of not come back to the the thing in fact there are i mean if you see the fiscal and primary deficit, there is a something like a 10 year cycle you had problems in 81 you went to the imf stabilized a little and then said that we will not do the reform you had a problem in 91 we went to the imf did some some serious reforms and then started stabilizing again in 2001 you know 10 1 2000 2001 one, we had a problem then we finally in 2003 4 we the passed the pass the fiscal responsibility budget management act and then went and again in 2008 9 onwards we had uh, uh, this serious problem so it comes you know the, the common factors that you see is coming pay commission recommendation oil prices and you know basically the electoral budget cycles now there is other thing that they talk about the lack of relationship in bond yields and the side of debt one of the major things that i think which we have not analyzed sufficiently you know in generally is the impact of the financial depression on the overall growth scenario you know you have um, i mean of course the the slr has come down over a period of time but then there are other things that impede the free uh, sort of so freedom of lending to the banking system what is called the so called priority sector lending and then you have small scale industries i mean they have got all sorts of protections but in addition to that small you know sort of you have the the favorable this thing as a result what happens is that you are denying you are crowding out the fund the household sector saving for basically these you know so, so, uh, these uh, activities and then the finance the the actually the industry uh, manufacturing sector doesn't get the the i mean you are basically financially crowding out the 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 sector the impact of that i think needs to be analyzed at a certain point of time and it's so it's always nice to say that your growth rate is higher than the interest rate and therefore the debt will stabilize but then the growth rate itself gets affected because of the financial depression that uh, that goes on and the debt dynamics i have a bit of a, a concern because projected debt scenario appears to be a little alarmist uh, not that i am i like uh, you know sort of having more and more <laughs> debt but the problem is without losing focus on consolidation it may be useful to take a li little more realistic view the it's important to point out that the distortions in economic cost due to financial depression which i already pointed out the role of inflation in debt dynamics needs more careful attention now in fact you know you deflate you know sort of you were um, both the interest rates and then the growth to make it real and then work out but the, the stock of debt 
that you have in the beginning of the year is the accumulation of fiscal deficits over a period of time and they are all in money terms and these are and in 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 constant prices i'm not constant in historical prices and obviously when you deflate it by the the current price gdp the 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 base year gdp will be lower so in in other words in the entire exercise inflation has been assumed away and i think you need to bring in inflation not i mean one of the nice ways to reduce debt is to inflate the economy but that is not <laughs> that's not what is really thought of but at the same time in when you are making a projection i think it would be useful to uh, to look at and in fact the finance commission uh, did make uh, uh, some analysis they did they did assume different nominal rate growth of uh, uh, you know growth of gdp um, ranging from you know starting from minus 6% Uh, in uh, 2020 21 and 13.5 9.6 10.5 11 and 11.5% you know that's the 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 assumption that they make and as a result i mean even then of course they come up with the, this thing that by 2025 26 um, i'll show you uh, their numbers by 2025 26 the overall debt gdp ratio will be some, something like 86% 84.6% but but you know if you look at it already this year if you see um it's 86.6% uh, which means that possibly the 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 it, it's not as alarmist as one thinks it to be i think it's better to be a little more uh, realistic uh <coughs> now baseline scenario better to take the average primary deficit you know, of uh, excluding the year 2022 or 21 because that's a, a complete outlier and, and so you do take 2021 as well and that is a complete so that's a, it's a small little thing that you can possibly do now if you really look at the finance commission's adjustment path this is the finance commission's adjustment path you'll see that the total liabilities is you know comes to somewhere about 80.5 85.5% or 86% by 25 26 now it's almost 86% already that means in 20 to 23 so i mean you have this i i would like you to go back and look at the thing of course the finance commission gives a caveat that um, you know sort of this should be really looked at because the impact is not yet over and they wanted a, a, a amendment to the frbm act and a, a much, much more detailed analysis to be done on contingent liabilities some of them are direct liabilities in fact the states you know the the distribution utilities uh, finances but some of them maybe you know there may be some probability attached to their becoming direct direct liabilities not that the entire the you know sort of contingent liabilities will come on the on the under government you need to be a little more uh, but of course we don't have the information the much of the de details but the, the contingent liabilities is a problem and uh, the problem is not just to confine to the center to the states but contingent liabilities is our problem center i mean in the last couple of years there has been an attempt to bring some of them into into the into the budget but then i mean if you say uh, i mean you know there have been i mean i wouldn't like to make a distinction because all the governments are equally you know so sort of they don't bother about the future you know in the sense that um, the future generation is not an important thing because they continue to borrow and do the contingent liabilities uh the carrying cost of large debt burden very explained in detail but let me add a few more there is a heavy interest outgo they displace the productive expenditures as already mentioned inability to meet the requirements of changing priorities inability to calibrate counter cyclical fiscal policy that i add to that the distortions arising from the financial depression to keep the cost of government borrowing low 
and impact of this high density on the sovereign rating and the cost and cost of external borrowing because obviously the, the credit rating agencies look at your deficits and debt and that is going to affect uh, again and much more important is the intergeneration equity question you don't think we we don't seem to bother about our children uh, or grandchildren for that matter but um, but the today's uh, debt is tomorrow's taxes so obviously we will have to to pay for that or tomorrow's inflation big problem or tomorrow's inflation yes um now i'll briefly come to this fiscal prudence no one of the things that in the paper i didn't see much but barry's presentation did make some attempt uh, is uh, where do we go from here what do we do how do we deal with the problem uh, there are no incentives for fiscal prudence and this is particularly true of states um, in fact um, you know if you look at the you know very old uh, papers redistribution and macroeconomic stabilization is predominantly predominantly a union central function so obviously the central government has to take a much more serious view of what the states do and don't and then you know deal with that because article 293 of the constitution gives them powers to contain the debt article 293 says that you see if the state is indebted to the center you can determine then why have we not really told them that this is all that we can do possibly you know i think center has to take a much more serious view and if punjab has been going on doing it it has been going on doing it for the last 25 years or more in fact the earliest study on punjab finances you know in fact it was taken up by dr chelaya and who forced it on forced it on me to do that thing that was way you know in the late 1980s now i mean even kerala you know the earliest study on kerala was done by me on 1984 you know it's as as bad as that now you know success your government have gone their power sector yeah their power sector subsidy is more than the fiscal deficit they have you know which means that the entire money that they borrow goes to the power sector so center so center has not adhered to the its own fiscal uh, fiscal rules since passing the frbm act it has not been able to contain the food and fertilizer subsidies the major problem with many states is their power sector despite several initiatives in the last 20 years the solution has been illusory stabilization is to done in clear responsibility of the central government and the state so article 293 as i have already mentioned says that the center can limit the states from you know sort of it can say that this is all the, i will allow you to borrow and it can put whatever condition it wants um, however hard budget constraint has been illusory gohan has said once i'll just take one more minute you know about the finance commission he said the finance commission can bark at the center but they bite the states now fact of the matter is finance commission neither bark nor bite and and nobody cares nobody bothers and let us let us be realistic i'm sorry for my apologies to dr singh but the fact of the matter is finance commissions come make their recommendations they go and the states and the union government go on their own uh many recommendations relevant to the center are simply ignored 15th finance commission has made important recommendations for the adoption of 20th century fiscal architecture compre- comprising three pillars effective implementation of rule based fiscal policy adoption of modern public finance uh, public finance management system and an independent assessment mechanism to provide assurance and guidance to the working of the first two pillars and that is the fiscal council the 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 in fact central go- union government has simply ignored all these uh, recommendations and they have positively said that they will not bother about the fiscal council because no they don't they don't want anybody to supervise them should the finance commission be made permanent bodies constitution allows that there is a legal opinion on that given by kk when you go for the ninth finance commission but 
as it is, Finance Commission is considered being evil. They have got to put up with because there is a there is a constitutional provision. So, will they make it permanent so, so that they can monitor this, so that you can have an institution for intergovernmental coordination, comp co regulating competition and uh, conflict resolution? I suspect we don't have. So, in what can be done? We need a hard budget constraint. Finance application of norms is still a work in progress. When it comes to uh, assessment, interest payments, oh, that is a committed liability. You take the whole thing. And, you know, obviously the, the states go, go on profligating and the interest payment uh, cannot be, you know, sort of becomes a part of a legitimate assessment. So the most central union and state government must privatize. State of Karnataka has 20 Mayura hotels all over the state. I don't know why they have to want. We still do not know, are cl not clear about what the role of the government is. Fortunately, G GST turned into be a money machine, and it will turn out to be over. It will, it will be, it will be the money machine. Thank you very much. Um, these are on, yeah. Um, I'm going to begin by uh, talking about the paper much more uh, a little bit. Uh, what I really want to do is, is focus on how the paper is presented, and I'll be fairly brief in my comments. Uh, Poonam and Barry have presented an extremely interesting and helpful paper on the challenges um, that the rise in India's outstanding public debt during COVID posed for fiscal policy. I really enjoyed reading this paper. Uh, it provides a very clear, detailed story of the dynamics and sustainability of public debt and deficits. That begins with. It, it takes a diagnostic approach, right? The diagnostic approach taken in the analysis is very well suited for examining debt sustainability, I think, and identifying the potential consequences of maintaining India's present levels of government debt and deficits. Indeed, the paper concludes the diagnosis with a general plan of treatment. There's a lot of information here, all of it relevant and important for understanding India's public debt. Barry, Poonam, and Aisha have done a very thoughtful and detailed analysis that I'm left only with highlighting points and making some small observations. Uh, as I said, I'm going to focus a little bit on how the paper handles it. Uh, Govind Rao has done a wonderful job of discussing, in particular, the conclusions of the paper and the, and the prospects for policy. Um, as we've seen, general government debt sharply increased with public spending needed to maintain household welfare and support business enterprise viability um, through the pandemic lockdown. The government appropriately sought to, we think, I think, okay, to smooth consumption under an adverse shock, right, by borrowing against repayments from future output. One way to meet such increases in debt is to pay the interest due in perpetuity, maintaining the debt to output ratio. This might be appropriate if all fiscal policies are constrained first best. It's the classroom result, also depends upon interest rates and growth rates. Now, um, what I'm concerned about in this paper, right, is that uh, India's post-COVID level of public debt may be unsustainable or perhaps more importantly, inefficiently high, and that fiscal policy changes are needed. That's the focus I'm gonna give of this paper and it gives. The first results, Right, indicate that despite persistent primary deficits, consolidated government debt to output ratio is likely to be sustainable given the interest costs of the current debt portfolio and projecting recent GDP growth rates forward. As pervasively, as persuasively, excuse me, argued by the authors, it's not enough in a risky policy-making environment, nor for the anticipated future expenditures, for example, for adapting to climate change. The presentation of the facts on debt and deficits to the central and state governments is thorough and to the point. Okay, again, it's already been discussed. I particularly appreciate the detail of the appendix and the depiction of trends in government finances. What I'm re referring to, right, is the explanation of sort of the breaking points, right, in the deficit uh, time series in particular is useful. Um, the paper's analysis of debt sustainability, right, considers both the government's 
capacity to maintain the present debt to GDP ratio and to avoid rollover risk managing its debt. The government of India has long enjoyed the ability to borrow at long maturities, right? And the government and the author's conclusion that rollover risk is not a serious concern does seem safe. The paper evaluates debt sustainability by using estimated growth rates, interest rates, projected primary deficits to simulate alternative paths for debt to GDP ratios for sensible scenarios. I think this approach is insightful and appropriate. It also might not be the one that's taken by other people. Although it contrasts, right, with the econ econometric alternatives of presenting stationary tests or estimates of fiscal rules. The problem with time series tests of debt sustainability is that these need to assume that the real rate of interest and output growth are given. With stochastic interest rates, stationary tests on present value of net debt are unreliable. As the summary statistics show in, shown in the paper reveal the variation in real interest rates for India's public debt is large. The covariance of interest and growth rates with each other, right, uh, as well as with the primary deficits are also evident in the, in the summary statistics. Appendix C shows the covariation co between interest rates, nominal and real, right, and the debt to GDP ratio in the time series plots and regressions. These illustrate the point that the assumptions underlying the conventional stationary tests aren't necessarily supported here. The typical alternative is to estimate a fiscal rule that relates primary deficit to the debt to output ratio. I'm not sure if a regression should be added, I doubt it, okay, because the plots of primary deficits illustrate very clearly that the response to the consolidated and separate state and state and center primary surpluses to debt ratios is weak at best. Okay, it looks pretty null. Overall, I think the authors have chosen a very informative way to look at India's debt sustainability. Might be that some people object to not doing econometric tests. Uh, I don't. I think that they've done a really wonderful job and I want to emphasize that. As the authors argue, a sustainable debt to output ratio may not be desirable level of public debt. The primary premise of the paper is that India's debt is excessive in terms of the opportunity cost of the interest payments. These costs include foregone spending on social and economic priorities and insufficient capacity to accommodate the risk of negative shocks, which is the latter is really emphasized. Although the baseline positive differential between the growth rate and trend real rate of interest implies a sustainable debt to output ratio, as Poonam and Barry emphasized, the risk posed by contingent liabilities, especially those of the states, is salient. The volatility of growth and in interest rates poses, right, another risk to sustainability, contributing to the argument for reducing public debt from its current level. That's the absence of being able to account for that risk. The simulations provide some idea of how great these risks are, but they depend on selected scenarios. Perhaps estimated moments for the growth rate and real interest rate could be used to quantify the risk in terms of fluctuations of the primary deficit that would be necessary to maintain the current debt to output ratio. However, contingent liability risk may be more difficult to estimate, but the same thing could be included in the paper. The remaining two items on the list of the potential costs of high public debt are financial risks. Despite the reduction of the statutory li liquidity ratio, commercial banks, both private and, and publicly owned, um, continue to hold sizable shares of their assets in government bonds. It's also true that other uh, financial intermediaries, provident funds and insurance companies own a, a large share of them. The author suggests an interesting potential risk to financial stability when banks hold large amounts of government bonds. The recent experience of Silicon Valley Bank, which seemed a little odd to me, underlines right, the point that banks need to tend to interest rate inflation risk when they hold long maturity bonds, even of high quality against deposits. Okay, it's the importance of deposit claims. Uh, insurance and provident funds may have similar volatility, but less similar, similar, uh, excuse me, withdrawal risk, but of much less volatility, I would expect. The reforms leading to the development of the government bond market and relieving the banks of holding public debt at below market interest rates might have created this new risk. Rather than lend to the private sector, banks opted for government bonds paying market rates, that is lazy banking. It would be ironic if the ability of the government to borrow at long maturities 
and risk-averse bank management led to a bank crisis. I think the paper makes a good point worth regulatory attention. The second financial risk noted in the paper is that further financial liberalization may reduce domestic financial institutional holdings of government bonds, leading to a greater reliance on international markets for India's public debt. That's been emphasized particularly in Barry's presentation. The fact that public debt is auctioned and traded at market rates does not mean that requirements to hold government bonds do not suppress equilibrium interest rates. I've made that point here in the past. Further financial reforms and progress in banking could lead to an increase in government borrowing costs. It's interesting that the regression of interest rates on debt to GDP ratios in the appendices show a negative relationship. There doesn't seem to be a premium to higher debt to GDP ratios. Over the data horizon though, financial liberalization and reform progressed. So they may not actually have an adverse effect on borrowing costs. It might be what we're seeing there in contrast to what we would expect to see. Moving to the proposed policy responses, I think the authors make a convincing case that fiscal consolidation should depend upon increasing public revenue rather than on expenditure reduction. I particularly like uh, the, uh, the, the counter to Alicina et al. Um, about the difference between uh, advanced economy experiences with high levels of government expenditures and taxes uh, relative to GDP and, and India or in fact uh, other uh, low-income emerging market economies. Um, they make an important contribution to comparing the consequences of, for growth of the public expenditure reductions to reduce government debt in 1991 and 92 with those of the revenue increasing um, reforms in 2004-05 and in, again in 2012-13. The observation that later reforms did not last might provide some support for the strong conclusion that substantial fiscal reforms are necessary to reduce public debt, but I also might note, right, just, just simply looking at the data, that that did end with COVID, with, as Govin put it, a uh, very uh, serious shock, uh, un unanticipated shock. Uh, we'll have to account for shocks in the future, but perhaps not that big a shock, we would hope. In conclusion, this is an excellent paper on a pressing topic for fiscal policy in India. I think it makes a case uh, for debt reduction, its case, and for new fiscal reforms to raise revenues, address contingent government liabilities, and mitigate moral hazard in fiscal devolution. That's a, that's a serious list of things, right? And Govan Rao discussed that in some detail, uh, how, how critical that might be, and Barry made a point of how substantial that kind of thing might be. That's out of uh, my wheelhouse. So I'll end with, I want to applaud how thoroughly the text and the appendices report the magnitudes and relationships in the data and how well the analysis is done and presented. I really thought this was really a great way of presenting the paper and a really nice read. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me at the outset say that it's a great privilege for me uh, to have been asked to chair this session uh, by Poonam. Just like you, Govind, I have also been associated with the India Policy Forum now for several years. And each year, there's an attempt to uh, excel what has happened in the past, the tradition of the India Policy Forum, bringing together people with domain knowledge to focus on issues of contemporary relevance has uh, only become more and more dominant. First of all, at the outset, let me say, Poonam, that this uh, paper by Barry and you is, by any reckoning, an outstanding contribution to the debate on fiscal policies, on the issues of debt, the management of debt. There is a degree of clarity in this paper where the conclusions are fairly sharp, when the data is fairly clear. I also believe that this paper, apart from resurrecting a subject on which uh, 
public debate has to some extent faded out, considering that there is no immediate impending debt crisis which we have faced, it tends to resurrect the issues of uh, long-term growth implications. And I liked what you said, Govind, in terms of the issues of intergenerational equity, which is often forgotten in, in public debate. I think this is an important issue, Govind, which you raised. But problems are really, are, have five points to make. First and foremost, if anyone reads this paper, will the person be led to a state of complacency? A complacency that nothing very imminent is happening right now, which would really place the country uh, to face difficult economic and political choices. I think that the growth rates, the nominal growth rates, by all comparisons, look to be reasonably good in relation to other peer group countries. The rebound from the post-COVID has been fairly sharp. Inflation looks very manageable. And that I think that there are no immediate policy concerns. Therefore, Barry, the points which you mentioned about the consequences of continuing with this scenario need far greater public debate than is possible. I think one of the points which also you pointed out is that the big choice which has to be made for a country like India, which has committed itself to a net zero by a particular date, will force the country to make difficult choices on the pattern of expenditure in terms of more and more emphasis on renewable fuels and the transitional cost in a socially orderly way will impose very high fiscal costs. This is a matter on which there is little scape. There is little doubt that international external support for the transitional finance, which is enormous, will be somewhat limited, even though multilateral institutions would increasingly attach much higher priority to the issues of the transitional cost and increase their lending very substantially in the medium term. Nonetheless, the issues of domestic resource mobilization in an orderly way will force the policymakers sooner than later to take steps where the entire scenario on fiscal deficit and debt needs to be significantly ameliorated. So that I think that we need much greater public debate on the consequences of growth suppression, but more than that, the cliff which awaits is not the tantrum of the serviceability of debt, but the tantrum arising out of the inescapable expenditure for meeting India's commitment to move towards a net zero sooner than later. The second comment which I want to make is a comment which is more granular. I think that both you, Poonam, and Barry bring out that the issues of uh, yield curves being more or less uniform arises not only on account of the financial repression on which Govind has pointed out very significantly, but is India following a policy where we are moving away from the broad principle that the yield curve must reflect the capacity of the states and in some ways penalize states which have indulged in unabated fiscal profligacy, rewarding states which have managed their finances more prudently. I think that we need to reconsider this approach. We need to move to a structure where the RBI recalibrates. I was asking Barry aside, how many countries in the world, for instance, have provision? And I find uh, Mr. Bhattacharya also here, and I have talked to him at length on this subject. How many countries are there which have provisions for sub-national bankruptcy? Perhaps quite a few, but we are not in that league. Because as long as markets have the comfort that the borrowings on the Consolidated Fund of India and the Consolidated Fund of the state inevitably leads you to a state of comfort where well, it doesn't matter what the state finances are, it may make no difference in terms of the cost which the market inflicts on you on your cost of borrowing. Therefore, there is no incentive 
for states to manage their finances more prudently as compared to states which manage them uh, more, more with much greater fiscal profligacy. I think that the paper, this paper is significant, Poonam, in terms of the sequencing in which you have. The next subject is the issues of the power sector reforms. This is inextricably linked with this issue because the issue of the contingent liability, as far as the power sector is concerned, is perhaps, as far as states are concerned, the most dominant issue. I do not know your experience, Govind, but my own experience, having visited all the states in India as the chairman of the Finance Commission, is that the big elephant in the room of each state are the liabilities of the state electricity boards, the unpaid liabilities of states to the electricity board, which is hidden in some form or the other by way of a continued liability. I also plead very much the absence of any transparency of data on this continued liability. Uh, Govind, I do not want to belittle the importance that the finance minister made two years ago when some very important hidden incidental liabilities were more transparently shown in the budget, the most important of which was the working of the Food Corporation of India and the small savings account. This was a major decision to make the data much more transparent. The recommendations of the Finance Commission for state governments to enact a similar kind of an arrangement and enact and change the their own fiscal responsibility management bill has unfortunately received and evoke little response. Yes, I agree with you that the center has the laxity, if I may say so, or certainly the great advantage of invoking more stringently the provisions of Article 293.3. But look here, would it be practical that uh, the central government in invoking that allows the states not even what they consider to be their customary right of 3% of borrowing under their own FRBM Act. Technically speaking, under 293C3, as we all know, and that's a sledgehammer approach. I do not think that the sledgehammer approach is the approach which is best designed for us. I think that we need a different mechanisms for enforcement of the fiscal laws and fiscal rules. This country has little place and little room of how to enforce fiscal rules. We know that financial literacy is a little better in the Indian parliament than they are in the debates of many state assemblies. Having been a member of parliament in the upper house, I can tell you that the interest of even parliamentarians on issues of this kind remains a merely esoteric concern. I do not think that it is worthwhile for me to say that in my six years, to be able to secure a one hour's debate on the issues of fiscal policy and fiscal rules could receive even the least amount of attention, even from people who are very knowledgeable. If this is the position, as far as the Indian parliament is concerned, I do not wish to comment on the state of play as far as state legislatures are concerned. So to some extent, uh, I think that different sorts of mechanisms need to be evolved to improve the quality of public dialogue on what one is losing out in terms of growth prospects, in terms of improving the credit rating, in terms of being able to secure intergenerational equity. I think that the current debate, which has occupied so much space, and I wish that uh, some of you, uh, particularly Poonam, or, and certainly I wish that Govind had touched on this current fashionable debate on whether freebies, which is being used in a certain masked sense of the term, is something which uh, states should really routinely be able to give. On the one hand, you have the question that, that makes the state finances more vulnerable. On the other hand, there is the issue of are they not entitled to spend the money as well as they have the right under the Constitution. Of course, everybody is entitled to do that. But the consequences of that are intergenerational equity, which you pointed out, Govind. And there is very little debate on the issue of intergenerational equity. 
So I think that, uh, let me say I totally agree uh, with the broad conclusion that uh, this is a false, it would be a false complacency to lull ourselves into that there is no immediate balance of payments crisis because uh, to some extent uh, uh, far-reaching banking reforms are uh, really being postponed. It's a can which we are pushing the thing down the road. Sooner or later, that will come to occupy a center stage. Sooner or later, the issue of funding in an orderly way, the transitional requirements for moving towards a more renewable era of not less and less use of fossil fuel, particularly on transport, particularly in many other areas, will cost the, both the central government and the state governments a significant amount of resources. And sooner or later, if they wish to rely on external sources, and sooner or later, if the revenue buoyancy does not improve very significantly, I think that's really postponing the day of the Great Reckoning. And the more orderly debate during this period that takes place on a complicated issue of this kind, better would India's long-term growth future be served. So I will certainly make the issue and end by saying that thank you, Poonam, thank you, Barry, for this very, very timely paper. And thank you for raising issues embedded in this paper, which really deserves much greater attention than it has received so far. I think there are no short-term answers. Finance Commission is not an answer to this issue. The Finance Commission itself, uh, Govind, you know that uh, someone earlier than you and earlier than me, Mr. Chakravarti Rangarajan, the doin on all this, has raised the issue that perhaps finance commissions, and we see that the 16th one is around the corner, and uh, will should occupy itself on this issue uh, in a significant way, the issues of fiscal concern. But it has become more and more an exercise on the vertical than some of the other more important issues, because it is part of the uh, framework of the Constitution that the recommendations are only advisory to the central government. They are not bound to carry out the recommendations made by the Finance Commission. Indeed, this has been the experience of all Finance Commissions in the 14 Finance Commissions which preceded the 15th, and that their recommendations are not binding on the President, which means the central government are more in the nature of advisory commissions. So other alternative mechanisms for effecting a more meaningful center state coordination. The center state council is a constitutional body. Perhaps uh, that can play a more meaningful role. Perhaps the issue of the fiscal council is one of the issues uh, which that center state council could perhaps resurrect that debate for a more meaningful relationship between the center and the states. Fed Indian fiscal federalism would need sooner or later to face and grapple with these more complex issues. The luxury of complacency and the luxury of the fact that all states, irrespective of their financial management, do not receive the treatment of the market, and the market is able in some way to be able to discipline them, is something on which we need deeper consideration. Thank you very much for allowing me to share some of my thoughts with you. you. I think that, uh, Poonam, if you permit, there, are, there is some few minutes left for some interventions by the floor. Would anybody like to ask uh, Martin, since you uh, very much uh, were involved in my crafting the FRBM report, uh, which on which I have not today commented. Uh, uh, would you like to raise any issue or pose any question? Uh, well, I haven't expected that entirely, but that I have, of course, questions. Um, <laughs> I have to say that I was been thinking about this um, when I look around the world and think about all the countries with fiscal problems, including very much my own, um, I am sensationally unworried about India. So, <laughs> uh, the, 
I, I mean, Olivia Blanchard has constantly reminded us that the relationship between the real, assume not grotesque fiscal ir irresponsibility, and India has not shown the crucial thing is the relationship between the real rate of growth and the real rate of interest. And unless India's economy blows up, managing the public debt ought to be pretty straightforward. That, of course, that's my main point. I, in that context, I have a very strong support of the uh, a commenter that inflation adjustment is essential in looking at these sorts of figures, and nominal figures can be really quite misleading, in my view. I'd like a comment on that. But the real question I have is on the political economy of revenue raising. Because I very much agree with the analysis. I had actually the same debate with Alberto about 25 years ago on it Italy, where the same problem existed, actually. So what are the obstacles to raising the revenue ratio with three or four percentage points? That's always a political issue. Um, but it seems very, very sticky. So what's the problem, and what can any government do about it? Well, thank you, uh, Martin. Before I uh, request Govind, who has written extensively on this, to uh, make a comment, let me say that, uh, Martin, you know, when you look at now India's overall revenue structure, uh, one in inescapable conclusion, which I faced when I visited the States, was that after the enactment of the GST, the extent of autonomy that states have on a wide range of taxes in their hands has been circumscribed very greatly. So the issue then becomes really how does one really make this indirect taxes? Uh, I even played with the idea of whether uh, the state should be given the leeway to have their own income tax in some form or the other, which exists in many parts of the world. But uh, uh, I found a huge opposition from a department which I had headed, namely the Revenue Department, uh, that uh, giving states the latitude on the direct taxes. So you come back to indirect taxes. And uh, except for alcohol and a couple of other items, and an area which has been unexplored in this country, which I believe has a huge scope, is property tax. And I think that the property tax, uh, some of the recommendations which you have made, is a huge unexplored area because there is no relationship between uh, the rates at which property tax is either being levied, much less realized. And so that's one, one area which is, I think, available to states, and I think I will encourage that. But the broad question, therefore, it will remain that with the GST, a lot of the ball is in the court of the central government. Govind, you would like to comment? Uh, thank you. Um, one important issue that uh, is plaguing, I think, many developing countries, but particularly India, is a large number of tax preferences that you have in the income tax system. In fact, um, you know, you, you know, tax policy is considered to be a kamadenu. It can achieve so many things. You can't achieve so many things. You just tax is meant for collecting revenue and do it. It's as simple as that. That, um, but then in the last uh, again a couple of years, the finance minister has tried to say that he will have an alternative tax system, and you can't be going on with the alternative tax system. You should say I'll cut down on these tax preferences, but I will reduce the rates, broaden the base, lower the rate, reduce the rate differences, have a simple system. That's that's something which we still have to learn. That's one of the the major things. There is a bigger, bigger issue called agricultural income tax. Now, you know, you, that's, that, that's a very politically difficult issue. So, you know, it is becoming more and more commercialized in some places, and even then, you know, you don't get any, any, any revenue from there. Property tax, as was said, mentioned, is the most important um, uh, area where we need to cover. But then the problem is the the, this is the local body tax, but then the states have to guide the local bodies to do it. The states have no interest in doing this. At the end of the day, you know, you have uh, this problem. But one of the important things that um, uh, Dr. Singh mentioned is the introduction of GST. After um, a lot of wake up, particularly because of the, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the inability to develop the technology uh, platform initially, the things have stabilized and things are going to do much better 
and this is the time that they should do the second generation reform where bringing in all other items which are left out broaden the base again rationalize the rates you can't have something like four main rates and then any number of rates rationalize the rates and uh, get rid of that rate called 28% you know you get about 12% uh, revenue from uh, total revenue from 28% and you can actually you know construction materials i mean there are variety of things i mean i don't want to go into the details but the point is that there are there's a lot of scope for doing it but in all these when you have the tax preferences the moment you give the preferences special interest groups develop these are the, you know distributional coalition it's not easy but then i hope that gst is going to be an important thing if we can do further reforms thank you i, I think that uh uh it's a fairly but let me make a counter comment on something which you said govind uh and that counter comment uh, entails both you and me uh this is because you mentioned govind that the states have no interest in the issue of property tax uh for purposes of running of the local bodies and little interest therefore on how the constitutional amendment which empowered the local bodies uh uh in terms of power uh functionaries uh, and uh, functions uh have to be enacted the culprit is both you and me why because technically speaking if you look to the constitution finance commissions are not obliged to make any financial allocation to the local bodies all that the constitution says is that just as the president appoints a finance commission central finance commission equally the governors of each state shall appoint a state finance commission at the end of exactly 5 years to help them to help improve the consolidated fund of the state for enabling them to fund the local bodies in practice what has happened is that successive finance commissions have continued to give large resources to for the working of the local bodies which has absolved the state government the pressure to act within their own constitutional right and for enabling them to find mechanisms for raising finances property tax they would have been forced to do i don't know about your experience my own experience was that many states do not wish to hear the word property tax so actually when we have for the first time made this an obligatory condition that to access the resources you need to have a property tax and what is very important we have indexed it at the same rate it it has to go up as the state domestic uh, resources are going up and the state per capita income is going up and the state growth rate. so it's indexed you have to raise the property tax as we go along and that's an area where i hope uh, more finances will be available uh, uh, yes manish please i have a question for you by this building on this wood corner why did the fiscal conservative in the west disappear is it just bad politics or do you have any thoughts on that and is it even possible or fair to commit future generations to fiscal conservatism I I can't quite tell whether this is working. Is It's yeah. very good. Um so the political economy of fiscal policy is complicated, but I think I would um lay the uh growing deficit bias in my country and a variety of other advanced economies on the doorstep of political polarization that starved the beast kind of stories where you cut taxes in order to hamstring future governments with a different set of policy priorities have become more uh attractive spend now on your favorite public programs before giving way to uh giving office to a government with a very different set of preferences has become more um prevalent as well so like many of the other ills of western countries um fiscal problems i think are are related to this polarization phenomenon 
that we're be just beginning to understand. I, I have some responses, M Mr. Chairman, please. to a couple of the other comments please. since yeah, my, my microphone is on. So, Martin, we tried to strike a balance between being fiscally sanguine and being fiscally alarmist. Um, I, I, I think we're justified in, 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 in feeling more of a sense of alarm than you expressed because uh, uh, the favorable uh, growth rate, uh, interest rate differentials that India has enjoyed are not guaranteed into the indefinite future, and we described some uh, reasons for that. And number two, uh, the evolution uh, of, of the debt ratio depends on, on Olivier's famous growth rate, interest rate differential, but also on the primary budget deficit. And India yeah. runs a substantial, it, right. it runs a overall budget deficit approaching 10% of GDP, half of which is primary and the other half is interest payments. So there is a issue there. Um, on, on raising more revenues, I would, would add a, uh, an, a, another aspect of the political economy. If India succeeds in raising more revenues through uh, a well-designed property tax or something else, how will the expenditure side respond? Are, are we justified in holding that constant or not from a political economy point of view? And finally, we did look at inflation in the paper. So it is you know, possible to do the same uh, accounting exercise using not the real growth rate and the real interest rate, but the uh, um, nominal growth rate and the real interest rate and the inflation rate. And in, in inflation does show up as contributing to debt consolidation in an accounting sense in our analysis, especially in the two debt reduction episodes that we look at in the paper starting in 1991 for about six years, starting in 2004 for about six years. So the, the question Poonam and I pondered this is what is the policy implication of that? Should we urge the Reserve Bank to run a higher rate of, rate of inflation? And I, for one, am not inclined to go down that road, uh, having looked at this issue in a variety of other countries for a recent project, there is no sustained impact on the debt ratio from an inflation shock. And as an economist, we know why that, that is. Interest rates respond eventually. They respond less the longer the maturity of the debt is, but they respond and maturities respond as well. And if you build a larger model where those uh, responses occur on other margins, the impact of inflation dissipates uh, very quickly and you end up right back where you started in terms of, uh, uh, of indebtedness with less anti-inflationary credibility. Thank you. I think there's time for perhaps... Uh, yeah, of course, Poonam. Um, <coughs> just a little anecdote on inflation, but I have more serious things to say. So I, I had inserted a paragraph in the paper that perhaps RBI need not interpret its inflation targeting framework so seriously that it has to peg interest rate at four. Maybe there is a case, at least from the debt perspective, to be a little bit flexible at 5%. Barry kept chipping on that paragraph. In the last version, it was gone completely. <laughs> so, so therefore, <coughs> whenever we talk, uh, discuss inflation here, I was quite amused. But overall, you know, there are a lot of challenges we have discussed regarding um, the current level of debt. Um, and the question is whether it's the right time to be uh, an alarmist. So fiscal fundamentalists, such as Dr. Rao and others, have been alarmist for all of the last three decades, and nothing has happened. Country has continued to grow. So the question is, do we still be balanced and use some other plug and one such plug is already in the paper, and, and Mr. Singh has mentioned, which is climate transition and other priorities, and what do you do about it? So why has this debt not been a problem so far? One thing that was in the paper and not in the current version, perhaps, is very high household financial savings rate. So the enough savings within the country to be able to finance deficit inefficiently through financial repression or whatever you may call it. Now, unless that equation changes, the, the stress will not be seen in the market. Um, now, household financial, net financial savings have started to come down because households have also started to borrow for their dura durable needs, and that equation may change, but we have no way to project when it will change. 
Um, among all the other um, challenges that we have discussed, one set of challenges we haven't had the room to discuss, which is how is the current level of public debt impacting the policy choices of the government? So to my mind, the fact that we still have majority of banking in the public sector hands has partially to do with the government bond market, right? If you, if you privatize these banks, you don't know what will happen to the bond market, even if they're not holding too much of excessive debt. Government's own, own bond market remains thin. Secondary market is, is very, very small. You don't want that market to develop because you don't know what interest rates it will yield. Corporate bond market, I've been hearing, I haven't done any research on it for all of the past two decades. The market is not picking up. So there are costs, it's just that it's very hard to quantify those costs and show their impacts. Um, just one last point, you know, we hear whenever finance commission is set up, that uh, through the Finance Commission and horizontal devolution of taxes, richer states subsidize the poorer states. There's another subsidization happening, which is more prudent states are subsidizing the profligate ones, which is through that interest rate evening out. So if, I mean, Gujarat should be certainly able to borrow at a rate lower than Punjab, but the fact that those, those rates are being kept uniform, there is any, yeah. another element of subsidy that's happening. Uh, just one last uh, half a point, privatization at the state level. Uh, Dr. Rao completely agree. You know, tax revenue to GDP ratios take time to increase, and that's a subject at least I haven't read too much about. You know, that can be a sure and early win. Thank you. Thank you. One last question. I think that... Uh, yes. I, yeah, both of you. One last question. Yes. Uh, thank you. <coughs> so, a um, couple of... Uh, <coughs> points. Oh, um, you know, having worked at the IMF for 33 years and now retired, I can speak more freely. So that's uh, uh, and related to that. Uh, what I want to say is, you know, on Barry's point about um, at some point the markets are going to get concerned about debt levels. Uh, uh, Barry, we did a study at the IMF, and uh, what we really find is that financial crises are not related to debt levels. They're related to rollover risks and the ability to service debt. That's what markets care about. They don't care about levels. So that's point one. Point two, and this relates to the question that Poonam asked about, I mean, how do we convince policymakers? To me, uh, and this is what we've done, many missions that I've led, they don't care about fiscal deficits. What they do care about is actually growth and they care about inflation. And the, the key point here in, in the Indian context is what the policymakers do is rational, they financially repress, and they have high fiscal deficits. So there is not going to be a financial liberalization or external liberalization unless they get the deficit in order uh, because it's going to be hugely costly for the government. So the way to get to the government is really about what uh, uh, you know has been mentioned by many of you, uh, <coughs> especially Mr. Govind, about the fact that it's Financial repression has huge costs in terms of growth. India's growth rate would have been much, much higher because it's highly inefficient, highly unproductive. And the second point is, and that's related to inflation. Inflation is not going to come down because it's very, very useful for the authorities to inflate away debt. Uh, why don't they want to bring the inflation down to 2%? Because, there is, uh, because it's going to be costly. So to me, if you want to convince authorities, you have to tell them that really you are paying a cost in terms of growth and productivity and higher inflation. Thank you. One last question, please. Thank you. A quick observation. When I was listening to the description of the data on the lack of dispersion of the interest rate paid across states, and uh, the description of how things work, like no risk-weighted assets for sovereign debt, essentially um, uh, potential moral hazard and expectation of bailouts uh, as, as explanations, um, you know, financial repression. It really reminded me of a euro area. <laughs> uh, and uh, between 1999 and 2008, 2010, the exact same phenomenon with no spreads between, you know, Greece and, and Germany, essentially. And then a very large financial shock and 2008, 2010, then 2010, the expectation that there would be some 
private sector involvement in debt restructuring, and then all the spreads widened uh, tremendously, and of course the Euroarea crisis happened. So there may be some things to think about here for, for India, and one of the key mechanisms was, of course, the doom loop, the famous what you call the diabolic loop, I call it the doom loop, between uh, the banks and uh, their very strong exposure to their, their own country's debt. This interacts with the fiscal revenues very strongly uh, of each country, and so this, this kind of triangle between the bank exposure to own country debt and fiscal revenues created a, a very large crisis in the EU area. So I, and, and we constructed after that some institutions to try to deal with that. And I, I think there could be something very interesting, maybe. Do you want to comment on it, Beck? Only that there is or was, I'll have to check, a, a footnote in the paper that reads, quote, European readers will be reminded of the mm -hmm. impact of ECB <coughs> policies on uh, European bond yield differentials in recent years. Uh, well, all that remains now for me is to thank all the two paper writers, uh, Barry and Poonam, for an outstanding paper to the two discussants, uh, to you, Govind, and to your other co-discussant, uh, that uh, it has brought together issues of great complexity on which there are no easy answers, but there are difficult policy choices which lie ahead. And I think that we will be making a foolish mistake into lulling ourselves into undue complacency because some of the points which have really come up deserve high priority attention. So thank you very much uh, for this first session in today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you.